I need to move this wide lathe through this narrow doorway. So it's going to have to get a bit thinner. Yeah, get and welcome back. Before I lobotomize this lathe, I really would like to try and find out which systems work. So that's what I'm going to get started with today. Now it's disconnected at the wall. Man, check this thing out. This is the main terminal block, like for connecting the main external power cable into the machine. This is made out of cast iron. <laughs> this is probably as heavy as the entire cross side assembly of my mini lathe. And all it is is a box. This junction box has got the main motor disconnects. So all I've done is connected the main winding straight into a VFD. And now we've got spindle rotation. Well that's good news. It looks like the total indicated run out is probably about one ten thousandth of an inch. Very slight flutter there. Let's have a look at the internal. And once again, it looks like the total indicated run out is less than one ten thousandth of an inch. Fantastic. So this measurement is now the run out on the actual face. And once again, it's basically nothing. That whole drive system's quite noisy. There's the noise of the toothed belt final drive. But it sounds like there's also a rumble on top of that. I hope there's no gearbox problems. Maybe it's just a bearing failure in the motor itself. Maybe there's a bearing going bad in the reduction gearbox. I guess we'll have to see. Here we can see the motor. And then above it. Is a gearbox that switches between 1 to 1 and 1 to 6.5. That's pneumatically actuated and the output shaft drives pretty much one to one with this huge tooth belt drive up onto the spindle. It's powered by a three kilowatt electric motor through a Vario drive or Variator. It's currently in its lowest setting. You can see here the mechanism which sets the speed of the variator. It's just got a little three phase motor driving down through that spindle gear through a bell crank and that pushes on that pulley. There's definitely something in there making a noise it's not supposed to. It sounds to me like it's coming from the motor or the variator. There are two circuit boards here in this control cabinet which I may well keep and recycle. This one controls the little three-phase motor which adjusts the speed of the variator and therefore the spindle speed. Now I have considered using a VFD a variator of course increases your torque so yeah I'm not not really sure maybe I keep this maybe I reuse it maybe I don't oh cool I got mail now that's a really nice handwritten note thanks engineering science guy you have to check out what he's doing with his 5 axi mill very impressive when Nikolai Owens reached out to me and gave me the 3d Heimer Engineering science guy saw that and remembered that he had some tips left over from when his shop burnt down. Man. Only follow this link if you've got a strong stomach, huh? This will make you cry. And anyway, thanks very much for sending me those Heimer tips. I really appreciate that. Hopefully, I'll never need them. The second board is this one, 126-19. This relay board controls pretty much all of the pneumatic hardware, also controls the main motor contactors. Now seeing as each of these uh, solenoid valves takes 9 watts of power, I'm guessing that I can't control them directly from a, a Mesa 7i77. I very much doubt they can sync that much current, especially not a a whole bunch of them in parallel. Before I make something new or put in a whole bunch of individual relays, I might as well just reuse this nice compact board like this. So this is a 24 volt DC rail along here. Power would go through the air solenoid and that's controlled by pin 7 and then this transistor which was controlled by the controller up here. So on the relay board this was pin 7 if I touch that to ground, which is pin 43, it should actuate that one air valve, which it does. 
Cool. So now I've got those pneumatics worked out. The things that really interest me are these two. This is the back gear for the main spindle drive, which is pneumatically actuated. Hürde Drehzahl, so higher speed would be the one to one position, and Niedrige Drehzahl would be the one to 6.5 back gear setting. So if I use if I earth pins 3 or pins 5, I should be able to select between those two settings. Okay, it certainly feels like either the back gear or the brake is set. So that must be the high speed position. That shows that the selection of the pneumatic back gear engagement is working normally. That's good. And the other one that really interests me is this line here. So if I lay pin 19 to ground, then I release the main brake. So disconnecting this one, disconnected the brake, that's good. Let's look at the coolest one of all, the tool changer, which must be pin number nine. That must be this one here. And connect it over to earth on pin 43. Well, it's trying to. Well, I'm over behind the lathe now, and what I definitely have is an air leak here at the, at the manual valves. I'm not sure how these valves are used, but they're supposed to be able to manually change tool position. Yeah, I'll have to ask one of the guys who's got one of these running to find out how they're sequenced. But at the very least, it's leaking air. Out of interest, I'm going to pull off the tool change revolver because it's got this pretty funky connector. It must have both the air lines and the electrical connection running over it. Someone's been on here before with some vice grips. I hope it still seals because it's going to be a nightmare to replace that. To get this whole revolver off is then just four of these clamping screws because the thing just clamps into the top dovetail ways. That's kind of always been a Shoblin feature that they always have a plain cross slide, clamp everything just to a dovetail across the top. Makes things very easy and quick to replace. Okay, I'm going to need a pipe on that. Well, I reckon this is well stuck down with coolant. Now it's moving. So stop there, I need to take off, and then I can pull it back. So how heavy is this thing gonna be? Just in case I put on my steel-toed work shoes before lifting this, in case I drop it. It's probably only about 10, 15 kilos, 20 maybe. Okay, so there's a little bit of pitting under there. But the rest of it looks quite good. Well, that's cleaned up quite nicely. No obvious damage. Just a wee bit of dried coolant. Thanks for all the great discussions in the comments section. A lot of the comments basically said, keep this control, get it running, it's really, really cool. Yeah, it's, it's easy to say that, but remember what we have here is a computer that only has a user interface. There's no way for me to connect to that computer and interrogate it and find out, is it even working? Is there a problem on the computer? Is there a problem in the interface boards from Schaublin? Picture it as being the same as trying to troubleshoot a modern car with all of its electronics for windows and doors and lights and all the stuff that it does, 
but not having an ODB widget, so they've got no way to actually interrogate the whole system and get, get fault codes and error codes. Well, that's kind of where I'm at. There was a conference right. of data general enthusiasts, I guess, so a couple of years ago, and they put a video, and on, in that video, cool. here's a snippet, this is what the, uh, the service guys they show the a data and, general uh, test yeah, computer, and I'm guessing that's probably what you would this, need to uh, connect into this to be able to interrogate it, which, that, you know, that's, that's just not realistic. The second thing a lot of people said was, why not integrate this into my Linux CNC controller? It's a nice idea, but most of this functionality is really not useful once you're using a modern touchscreen interface like Linux CNC's Gmocha Pi, which I really like. You know, all of this numeric stuff can easily be done with either the touchscreen or a keyboard. Choosing between threading and uh, a lead, well, that's done with G-codes. Millimeter inch is also a G-code selection. I probably will need something along the lines of this where I select a tool and then change position to that tool, uh, but that's also pretty easy to, to implement, I'd say. Spindle speed selection is well integrated into the Gmocha Pi, as are all of this sort of stuff. I'm definitely going to need a modern latching e-stop. This wouldn't meet any safety standard. I will be implementing a feed override. That's kind of normal. Don't need that, don't need that. All of these modes are covered within Gmocha Pi's interface. Joystick jogging seems attractive, but really I don't think it is. I'm going to use two MPGs and just be able to jog with those. This is also a pretty clunky interface for, for jog speed selection. I think I've got that covered much better using an encoder on the Maho. So as you see, I can't get this going because I can't troubleshoot the computer or the, the massive number of interface cards from Shoblin. I don't want to butcher it because I think it's cooler to keep it original, keep it complete. In fact, I have contacted Shoblin and offered them this whole module plus its computer if they've got a corporate museum and need it. But if they don't want it, there's a museum in Holland, I've been told, maybe interested. Maybe there's a collector who might want to buy it. I, I don't know yet, but it's definitely not going to, into the scrap heap, that's for sure. Now, I was wondering how much wire I'm going to need to buy for this retrofit, but looking at it, I think I'm going to have so much recycled wire, I'm not going to have to buy any. That's it, I've put it off long enough. Now it's time to clean all of the stuff out and remove this cabinet.
Well, there we have it. That all went significantly faster than I expected. Let's see if we can just lever this off its hinges. Well, with the control cabinet out of the way, the next thing is let's get rid of the brain. Okay, that's the stop screw. Okay, without the mini computer installed, we can see this side is really just a connection. This is where all of the main I.O. gets connected on the outside. It's just pictures, traces. There's a couple of ICs on there, but not much going on. The control panel's got two boards on it, and the rearmost one is itself a backplane adapter, which then has these two boards slotted into it. There's a whole bunch of other smaller boards on the back of the main controller. I wonder why they use so many spade connectors. You don't really see these anymore. Most of the machinery stuff I've seen uses screw connectors. Comment in the comment section on why spade connectors went out of fashion. Maybe they're more prone to corrosion in the contacts or something. All this discrete wiring from up here on the control module down into the electrical cabinet led to a huge amount of wiring. I mean, look at this massive bundle of wires. When I replace the controller, I'll probably need one single phase power supply up into the brain. There'll definitely be one CAT6 cable that comes back down to like a Mesa card and a second CAT6 cable going back up to like a Mesa 7i73, you know, something just to interface all of the buttons and stuff on the control module. And that may well be it. Okay, well those have been soldered. This is just the connector for the fans that sit up on top of this module to keep it cool. Really don't like doing this, but in this case this doesn't really matter. Getting smaller and lighter by the minute. This cover's just here to uh, clean the swarf out through on the back of the machine. It's going to be up against a wall, so I very much doubt I'll use it, but this needs to come off just to get it through the door. Right, let's remove the coolant tank. Okay, it's got a pretty funky little three-phase socket. I really don't get the logic here. You've got the electric coolant pump 
which is uh, controlled by a switch on the front. But then you have this pneumatic solenoid to actually control the flow out of the pump. I mean, why not just use the pump's electric on off, huh? This seems kind of unnecessary to me. Yeah, it's going to be fun cleaning the soup out of there. Straight up into the deep fryer, huh? Anyone want some fish and chips? Actually, maybe it's not that bad. There's kind of a nice thick tar-like layer at the bottom which peels off pretty easily. So, that's going to be easy enough to clean out. Bronze reinforced tar. Although, seeing as the slave came out of Switzerland, maybe I should refine this because it's probably not copper. It's probably the gold they make the Rolex watches out of. To move the lathe through the narrow door, both the e-stop's foot pedal and the collet release pedal are going to have to be removed. Which means working in here behind the coolant tank. Hmm. Better get some overalls for this one. Next up for removal, the x-axis motor cover. I wonder what accessory mounted on this plate. It's, uh, it's just a cover plate for the electrics which must be on there. They've put a nice T-slot in there. Oh, I get it. This is the coolant distribution head. It's mounted to the same sort of T-slot on the headstock. So I guess you have a choice between mounting it fixed to the headstock or moving with the cross slide. Now so we'll take off the coolant supply. Considering its age, even the paint's in pretty good condition. Well, that's about enough for this week. Next week, I'm going to have to start pulling the pneumatics and thinking about workshop Tetris. Thanks a lot for watching.